extend a special welcome to you. Welcome to Stone House. I'm going to move this. I'm going to start with a, a word of prayer, and then I'm going to read Psalm 95. First of all, um, leading into our time together, we are, as a church, um, collecting tithes and offerings, but we mostly, most of us give online uh, just once a month, but we still, in this time, want to recognize that God has given gifts to us, and then we are returning some of what God has given to us to him and the work that he's doing in the world. God has shown us the meaning of generosity in the beautiful diversity of creation, in the overflowing love of Jesus Christ, and in the never-ending gift of the Holy Spirit. God has abundantly blessed us and called us to be a community that honors one another and the world and to love and serve others with joy. And he's called us to give freely and generously. So let us rejoice in what we have been given and in what is ours to give. Let's pray. Yours, O oh Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory. All that we have is yours. Therefore, Lord, receive our offerings, our tangible expressions of love and gratitude. Transform them into a source of life for many people, so that your kingdom may grow in the hearts of all. Almighty God, this morning we pray for strength and relief for those who are suffering. There are those among us who are part of Stonehouse that are suffering, but there are others in our families and amongst the people that we know and in our communities and especially in our world that are suffering at this time. God, would you comfort them in their time of suffering? Would you uphold them? Would you provide for their needs? Would you bring them relief and healing God, we pray this morning that we will hear what you are saying to your church, that we will understand ourselves a part of that, part of what you are doing in the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm going to read Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For Yahweh is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are also his. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come. Let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before Yahweh, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as at Meribah, and on the day at Massah in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test, put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For 40 years I loathed, I loathed that generation and said, They are a people who go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. I'm going to invite uh, Dr. David Johnson to come up and share the word from no, uh, Numbers 20, 1 to 13. So if you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn. Thank you for the invitation to uh, be here, um, and, uh, and I want to bring greetings to you from Providence. Uh, I'm the president there, as all of you I think in the room know anyway, and uh, can you hear me all right? Okay, I guess we'll have to use this. Again, thank you for the opportunity, and, and uh, I want to invite
invite you to, uh, to an event that Providence is having on Thursday night. It's a half an hour. It's online. Um, it's our Harvest Festival. This is the first time we've ever done this online. There's no banquet, unfortunately. <laughs> but, uh, but there is a Harvest Festival, and that is Thursday night at 7 o'clock. If you go to prov.ca, P-R-O-V.ca, um, and scroll down to the events uh, part of that page, you'll find, uh, find the event. Just click on that, and there's pretty clear directions as to how to uh, how to how to go about uh, registering and, and attending that uh, harvest festival, um, virtual harvest festival this year. I'd like to begin by reading Numbers chapter 20, verses 1 to 13, in our study of uh, the wilderness wanderings of the people of Israel. Uh, we've now come close to the end of uh, of that wandering time. So uh, Numbers chapter 20, uh, verses 1 to 13, if you have a Bible with you. In the first month, the whole Israelite community arrived at the desert of Zin, and they stayed at Kadesh. There, Miriam died and was buried. Now there was no water for the community, and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. They quarreled with Moses and said, if only we had died when our brothers fell dead in the, before the Lord. Why did you bring the Lord's community into the wilderness that we and our livestock should die here? Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs, grapevines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Moses and Aaron went from the assembly to the entrance to the tent of meeting and fell face down, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. The Lord said to Moses, Take the staff, and you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together. Speak to that rock before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of that rock for the community, so they and their livestock can drink. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence, just as he had commanded him. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels. Must we bring water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out in the community, and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. These were the waters of Meribah, where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord and where he was proved holy among them. Let's pray. Gracious God, we ask you to take your word now and use it for your glory. We pray that you would use it to strengthen the church and to strengthen us as individuals. We ask you to do this uh, in Jesus' name and for the good of your church. Amen. So one day, Israel came to this place in the wilderness of Zin. Miriam there died, and the people complained because there was no water to drink. They said, why did you bring us up here? You promised us a land flowing with milk and honey, and here we are. There's neither, neither fig grain or figs or pomegranates or grapevines. There's nothing to drink. And God said, and, and so Moses went and before the Lord uh, and, and said, what should I do? And, and God said to him, I want you to go in and I want you to take the staff. That very staff that you had used um, that when, I, when you first met me at the, the burning bush. That staff that you used when, when, when you hit the ground with it and the people of Israel uh, uh, experienced, or the, the people of Egypt experienced the plagues. You struck the Nile and it turned to blood. You struck the ground and uh, gnats came up and grasshoppers and all those other plagues. This is the very staff that you used. You held it up before the, 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 the Red Sea and the Red Sea parted and all the people went through. And now Moses had kept that staff and he put that staff in, uh, in with the Ark of the Covenant and close to the Ark of the Covenant. So it was a holy place. And Moses went and he got the staff. And he came out and he brought the people out. And he said, now do I need to bring water for you out of this rock? This rock, with the emphasis on this rock. And the 
did so. And he, and he, and he, he came there and he, he raised his arm and, and he struck the rock twice. And, and the water came out. But Moses was told at that point that because he didn't trust the Lord, that he would not be able to enter the land. What does it mean he didn't trust the Lord? Well, this, this story recalls for us uh, the story that we've already seen at the very beginning of the wilderness wanderings in Exodus 17. And, and, he, and, and there Moses uh, did the same thing. The people complained that there was no water. And, and God said, go and strike the rock. And, and when he struck that rock, the water came out. And the people were, were, were watered and, the, and their livestock were watered. But this time... God says to Moses in, in Numbers chapter 20, now after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, um, he says to Moses, speak to the rock, and the water will come out. Now over this, over this 40 years, and over the, the books of, of uh, Exodus, the rest of Exodus, and Leviticus, and the first part of Numbers, um, Moses has, has, sort of, has sort of become the instrument of God. In fact, in Numbers chapter 12, it, it says that when, when Miriam and Aaron were trying to, trying to say, well, Moses, you're not the only one to whom God speaks. God brings them out and, and all together in Numbers chapter 12 and, and says to Miriam and Aaron, you know, when I speak to the prophets, I speak through dreams and visions. But with Moses, I speak face to face. You see, Moses' words become, in a sense, God's words as the story develops. And so when God said, speak to the rock, what he was saying was, trust your word. And Moses didn't speak to the rock. He struck the rock. He struck it twice so that the water would then come out. But because he didn't trust in his own word, which was the word of God, the powerful word of God, he wasn't able to enter the land with all the rest of the people. So one day, uh, Jesus was in the temple. In John chapter 7. And, and the people were wondering about him. He, nobody knew that he was there. Um, he, was just, he was just there, sort of incognito, and, and uh, nobody knew that. And, uh, and they were debating, who is this guy? They kept talking about, who, who is this guy? He does all these things, which are miracles, but, but he also says some really strange stuff. We don't know who he is. And then, on the very last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus stands up. It's called the Great Day of the Feast. The day in which the priests would go to, the, to the, the Pool of Siloam and they would gather water. And they would bring that water in buckets and they would come to the, come to the, the, the altar of the, of the, uh, in the temple and they would pour the water on. And on that last and great day of the feast, Jesus stands up and he cries out with a loud voice in John chapter 7 and verse 37. And he says, let anyone who is thirsty come to me. Now I'm reading the, the footnote here um, in my New International Version because I think it's a better translation of the, of the Greek in this case. But he says this, let anyone who is thirsty come to me. And whoever believes in me, let him drink. As the scripture has said, out of him will flow rivers of living water. Out of him will flow rivers of living water. Jesus has in mind, I think, the story of water in the wilderness. That's pretty clear um, when, when Jesus says, out of his belly, and that's what it says actually in, in out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. He's referring to himself. And, and in, the, in the stories in, in Exodus 17 and Numbers 20, it talks about the water as coming out of the rock. Not just from the rock, but out from within the rock. And Jesus is saying this to, to the, the people here, that, that I am the source of this living water. And he's thinking back to that story of, uh, and, and, the, and the, the Israelites, the Jews at that time would have recognized this, I think, by the language he used. He's thinking back to that story in Exodus 17 and Numbers chapter 20, 
um, where the water pours out and Jesus is saying, I am the one from whom the waters pour out. And then John goes on and explains in the next verse, verse 39. By this, Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who is poured out, who, who, who is poured out from Christ. In, in the Gospel of John in particular, the Holy Spirit is poured out from Christ to the church. So one day, there was a, a church in the city of Corinth. And in that church, uh, there, was a, there was a number of people, probably not very many more than the people sitting in, in this room right now. Uh, small church, most, almost all the churches were 20 to 25 people in, the, in that first century. Um, and, and, and so they're sitting there, and, and their pastor comes in and says, I've just received a letter from the Apostle Paul, and I'm going to read it for you. He begins to read, and he reads about uh, the various things that, that the people of Corinth were facing, the, the struggles they were having, and so forth, and, and how they were to live. And then he comes to what we call chapter 9. Of course, he didn't have chapters in the, in, when it was first written, but he comes to what we call chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians. And Jesus, or, or, or Paul, writes this. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? There's only one winner. And then he says, run in such a way as to get the prize. Now, he's not saying that, that there's only one person who's going to make it in, in, in the church. What, what he's emphasizing is the idea of running in such a way that you win. Running in such a way that you win. He says in verse 25 of chapter 9, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. And that's the emphasis. Discipline. Self-discipline. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a box or beat in the air. No, I strike, my, strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself, not be disqualified for the prize. Paul. I mean, he, he, this is St. Paul. How could he think that he could ever be disqualified from winning the prize? And yet he says, I, 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 I continue to work hard at my Christian life. It's not easy to live the Christian life. And Paul says, so, so I worked hard at it. It just doesn't come natural to me. He goes on in, in chapter 10 and he says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, and that they all passed through the sea. And of course, he's thinking about the wilderness wanderings of the people of God. And he says, They all had this cloud, the cloud that led them by day, you know, that they followed whenever the cloud would go up, the people would follow that cloud. And they all went through the sea, that is, the Red Sea, when Moses uh, lifted up the arms with the staff and, and the Red Sea parted and the people went through and, and then the Egyptians followed and they were drowned. They all, they were all baptized, he says in chapter 10 and verse 2, they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. That is, they identified with Moses at that point. They all ate the same spiritual food. That, of course, would be man, the man that came from God, from heaven. And they drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. They drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, that rock from which water poured out. And then he says, and that rock was Christ. That rock was Christ. And they all drank from that rock. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Those people who wandered in the wilderness, that first generation, they, they, they almost all died. And now the new generation is taking over. In, in Numbers chapter 20, and they start out the same way the old generation did. That's our tendency. Our tendency is to, to complain. Our tendency is to wander away. Our tendency is to 
that's what Paul was telling us. So one day, the Israelites came to the, to the wilderness of Zin and complained about water, and Moses gave them water out of the rock. And one day, Jesus um, was in the temple. And he preached, and he said, if you believe in me, you will drink from this water unto living, this living water, which is the Spirit. And one day, this church, this small church in Corinth received this letter. And, and when they received that letter, they read about Christ, who is that rock from whom the waters flow. One day. But what about today? What about today? Here, October 25th, at Stonehouse Covenant. The author of Hebrews talks about it today. He says in chapter 3 and verse 7, So as the Holy Spirit says, Today, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. I supplied water all the way along. That rock that followed them, as Paul says, that rock is Christ. And he provided all of their needs. They saw what I did. And they still tested and tried me. That is why I was angry with that generation, it says. I said, their hearts are always going astray. They have not known my ways. So I declared in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you, and, and, and the emphasis there is not one of you. Make sure there's nobody in the church. Make sure there's nobody among you who has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ. Indeed, we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. The author of Hebrews is laying it upon the church gathered. The church, as we, as we are gathered together as a church, whether it's here or online, the author of Hebrews lays it upon us, lays upon us the responsibility for one another and for our spiritual and that's why later on he says, don't forsake this, the assembling of yourselves together, as is the habit of some. You know, I've, I've read a little bit about uh, the church post-pandemic. And, and there is some, some people who are saying that when the pandemic is over, people are going to be so used to sitting at home and watching their favorite preacher that the, the church attendance is going to go down. I think we have to be careful that we don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but that we gather together because it's as we gather together as a community that we will, we will in fact, encourage one another day after day, as long as it's called today. Encourage one another to continue walking in the faith, knowing that, knowing that it, is, it is those who persevere who, in the end, I was a pastor for seven years. Um, went to this church, had about this many people, maybe with a few of the people online, there was about 25 people in the church. And, uh, and I, I came on August 1st of, of 1980, I think it was, 1980, August 1st. So almost 40, a little over 40 years ago. I can't believe it's been that long. But, uh, but we came there and, and that first week, there was these 25 people in church. That church was about this size, it had a room about this size, and it held about 120 or 125 people or so. And, uh, <clears throat> and I told the, 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 the congregation um, th that first, the first couple of weeks, I said, you know, by Christmas, this was August 1st, by Christmas, this place will be full. 
And around Christmas time, we had 25 people. In fact, we had 25 people for three years. Average attendance on a Sunday morning was 25. I remember preaching to six. And three of them were my family. Uh, this is when Shannon was born and the other two girls were in the world. So, so, so that was a small congregation. And I preached my heart out. In fact, I go back to some of those sermons that I preached back then. I still have some of the notes. And I look at them and I think, you know, that wasn't such a bad sermon. And I find illustrations there and I use them and so forth. And, and, I, and I, I, I preached my heart out to those people. <coughs> But, but outside of that, that and my superintendent and, and people like that, that, and they said, hang in there, and, and God spoke to me in various ways, and, and I stayed. And that's what God is calling us to do, to persevere, to keep going. As long as it's called today, our calling is to follow the Lord, because he is the source spirit. He is the source of the word of God. And in fact, the author of Hebrews goes on in chapter 4 and he says, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. The word of God. The word of God is alive and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart penetrates to the very depths of our being. And so I want to encourage us all to keep going with that word because that is the power of God. That is the, that is the sword of the spirit that comes into our lives and, and strengthens us and keeps us going and keeps us following Christ. So we looked at three stories. What about today? What about today? Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you are with us every day. And you are with us in particular through your people. Help us to encourage one another to hold fast to the word, to hold fast to Christ, from whom living water flows into our lives, from whom that spirit that you have given us, your spirit, becomes a reality for us. And so encourage us through your word and by your spirit to serve you with all of our heart. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.